Should machine speech technology mimic human speech? A new study sheds some light on the topic. I'm Tanya Hall, and joining me is Dr. Lee Clark, lecturer in computer science at the Computational Foundry at Swansea University in the United Kingdom. Welcome, Dr. Clark. Thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. Give us a brief summary of your work with speech interfaces and tell us how you became a speech technology maverick. Um, so I suppose it starts with my undergraduate degree. Um, I'm going to do the reverse kind of answer here. And my undergraduate degree was in linguistics. So I really got interested in a field called sociolinguistics. So it's a lot about why we see the things we do in particular contexts. And I thought that was um, tremendously interesting. And then I went to do a PhD in computer science and I thought, well, why not just apply all my existing knowledge into human computer interaction? And that's where I started to kind of, um, let's say, start my maverick journey into speech technology. And since then, I went on to do postdoctoral work in Dublin. I'm now a lecturer in Swansea University. And a lot of my work looks at the user side of interaction with speech technology. So rather than looking at the building side of things and anything to do with algorithms or equations or anything that will confuse me at first sight, I'm looking at how people interact with speech technology, how they behave, how they perceive the technology, and how design choices around things like um, the voice um, technology might use or the type of language it uses, how that impacts upon these perceptions, uh, these behaviors, and this overall user experience. So this might include some very controlled experiments inside the lab where you're comparing two different versions of maybe a kind of mock-up system or an experiment using an existing bit of tech like Google Assistant or Amazon Alexa. Or this might be something that's more exploratory and qualitative. So this might be um, kind of philosophizing about the nature of human-human and human-machine conversations and what this might mean in terms of future interaction design. So it, it, it covers um, a widespread of research and I think it's absolutely fascinating. And I would say that. You were part of a research team that examined natural language interactions between humans and a digital assistant during simulated driving. Start by describing the setting and conditions of this experiment. Yeah, so this is to conduct what we call a Wizard of Oz experiment, which is where you tell the participants they're interacting with uh, an interface, a particular piece of technology, but in reality, it's a wizard, uh, another person in a different room that is actually doing the, the talking. So we present this bit of software and say, would you please interact with it in this driving simulator task? And they say, sure, but it's actually someone upstairs who has a live feed into the driving simulation area and will kind of throw in a few phrases that makes it seem like it is a bit of technology, like, can you repeat that? You know, using those, um, those little kind of linguistic devices. And the idea was, quite exploratory. It was to look at how people would interact with this kind of technology when it's particularly free form. That is, there's no exact clear limitations of the technology or indications of what is available for the people to say to the technology. Um, so, there's this kind of idea going back decades that we treat technology in very similar ways that we do as other people, the computers as social actors paradigm. Yet when you ask people how they interact with speech technology, they always say, well, you know, it's very basic. I wouldn't treat it like I would a person. This kind of um, almost dissonance going on. And when we had people interact with this bit of technology, it was you know, actually a wizard in his driving simulator tasks, we'd find 
the conversations had very similar echoes of what would be in human-human communication. So this might be things like being polite to the system, saying thanks or saying sorry when there's no real need to apologize to a machine. You're not exactly going to hurt its feelings, but it's something that we are so used to doing in human-human communication that it spills over into human-computer interaction. People would do other things like they would allow the system to take the initiative in certain parts of the conversation. So sometimes the system would be driving the interaction, other times the um, participant would be driving the interaction. And this, of course, happens a lot in human-human conversations. Sometimes I won't stop talking for about half an hour and I'll be very much what's called having the floor. Other times I'll be happily nodding and listening and going, mm-hmm, very interesting. So there's this um, back and forth that exists in these interactions as they do in human-human um, interaction when the possibility is offered. Um, it should be noted though that because this was a Wizard of Oz study and it was free form, it essentially represents technology that doesn't exist in that in theory, you could ask it anything and it probably would respond with anything. And while that's true to a certain extent with things like Alexa and Google Assistant and Siri, it's the fact that it is a human represents something that's maybe years away. But it is very interesting to look at what the possible interactions might be. And if given the option, would it be different at all? So... Did did any of the human to machine conversation involve giving driving instructions or was the conversation strictly social and not related to the task of actually operating the vehicle? It was partly task based and partly this interpersonal and social talk, which again does mirror a lot of human human interaction. So there'd be very task based things um, regarding if the participant wanted to send a message because they were late for an upcoming meeting, you know, this kind of hypothetical um, scenario, or they indicated to the driver that, oh, I see that your list says you need to get some milk. There's a shop nearby. Would you like to go to the nearest shop? And they'd, you know, respond with, oh, where is it? How far away is it? Um, so it'd be looking at these very, um, very relevant task based elements, but also having um this very kind of human like back and forth within it there'd be other things that would be hey can i like play some music what's your name etc and yeah people would respond in very human like ways and in terms of the um end results not everyone believed it was a machine but a good number of people did other people were very wary that it seems to be either a new piece of technology or just a person and would very much try to test it, if not break the whole thing, which is, you know, part of the fun of doing these experiments. You mentioned, um, you know, being polite and how as humans, we tend to say things in a, a certain way and, and that might be different than, than technology. So to what extent should speech technology mimic human speech? So there's a, good debate around this at the moment and sometimes it can be split in terms of the voice and the language as a separate entity around speech so in terms of the voice um, synthesized speech has become like pretty brilliant recently as of 2016 when google introduced their wavenet voices um they sound increasingly natural, which is to say they sound more human-like. But there's almost this design trope of having naturalness or human-likeness as the gold standard, if not the only design goal, which to one extent is a bit lazy and uncreative, but to the other extent, it can be deceptive, potentially harmful. If you remember things like Google Duplex, um, which can ring up, say, a florist or a barber's or a restaurant on behalf of their user and have this very convincing human-like voice. 
um, they also have these human-like elements in terms of language, like including pausing or mm-hmm and displaying hesitation. And there's an argument to say, what's the point in doing this unless you want to pretend it's a human and thus dece deceive people? And I don't think people quite like being deceived. There's also this element in terms of language that what is the purpose of interacting with speech technology and how does it compare to human-human interaction? So in human-human interaction, we want to get a lot of stuff done, but we also want to build and maintain interpersonal and social relationships. And these two will often intertwine quite seamlessly. With machines, they're tools currently. They're very, um, very utilitarian. It's we want to get stuff done, there's not really this idea of interpersonal and social relationships outside maybe some research in healthcare where it might be a useful addition. So to chase human likeness as a design goal in itself, um, it might be limited to a particular context where having an interpersonal or social bond is very helpful, um, but it shouldn't be the only design goal. It shouldn't be a, a kind of default. There's, um, and then there's also this idea, which is kind of a philosophical one as well as a technological one. So as well as it being very difficult and requiring a lot of data in order to kind of mimic these human, human conversations, the human machine conversations, there's this kind of philosophical concept of, is, is there a fundamental limit to our interactions with machines? Um, it's always fun watching things like Star Trek The Next Generation and watching Commander Data you know, question his own um, machine likeness and how it, what it means to be a human, what it means to be a machine. Are we ever going to have the same conversations and the same desires to have conversations with machines? Um, perhaps not, but perhaps this is me reflecting on technology in 2019. We might chat in 20 years time and I might, we might have, you might have a co-host who's, um, a machine and we have a very good chat about philosophy and the meaning of life. But for now, I think it's very niche. And I think the important thing is when designing this technology to consider the context in which it's being applied and how appropriate human likeness is a, as a design goal. Very interesting work. And you just replaced me with a computer. Computer, okay. I'm so, so sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Lee Clark, lecturer in computer science at the Computational Foundry in Swansea University, United Kingdom. If somebody wants to connect with you, Dr. Clark, what's the best way they can do that? They can go to my beautiful website, lmhclark.com. So lmhclark.com, or follow me on Twitter at lmhclark. Sounds good. Thanks again for joining. And if you guys want to find more of my interviews, you can do that right here or go to tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching.